You know you're in South Carolina when the weather's a little bit funny and it's still May. We've had some cold days. I had to find a sweater. And we've had some hot days. And then we had, at my house in St. Matthews, over five inches of rain in one afternoon. That's just what it's like to be a gardener in South Carolina. But you know what? We just keep on doing it and have a good time. I'm Amanda McNulty with Clemson Extension, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight for Making It Grow, coming to you live from historic downtown Sumter. Teresa Young is in the chat room, and she would enjoy your company when we go inside. She's I'm sorry, Teresa Lott. Teresa has a new name because she's gotten married. She would enjoy your company. She's still the same nice, friendly person who's always been in there, and she will explain how easy it is to join her in that venue. We also take great trips with Making It Grow, and one of my favorite native flowers is the native azalea. And we visited a yard that had a collection that cannot be surpassed. What a treat you have in store for you there. Of course, Dr. John Nelson will be with us with another of his puzzling mystery plants. Always fun for us here at Making It Grow. And today we have most everybody from the Holy City up here with us. We've got um, Tony Bertowski and some of his students who are going to really add a lot to the show and we're going to learn how to make a patriotic window box. What fun we've got in store. So let's go inside. Teresa Lott. It's going to take me a while, Teresa. Um, my um, cousin Sophie said that um, when she got married and they got back from the honeymoon, her husband drove her back to her mama's house and that she was kind of put out with him. So we are so happy, though, that Teresa Lott, who's a natural resources agent over in Florence, is with us and is concerned with water issues. And Teresa, um, remind us why it's so important to um, keep our yards not to have trash and to occasionally do litter pickups when we have five inches of rain. Oh, definitely my pleasure. But first, let me say, don't worry about flubbing my name. I signed my name with my old last name today. So uh, it'll take me probably a year to get used to it, just like writing a new year on a check. <laughs> it is very important for us to protect our water resources anytime it rains. Anything that's left on the ground does have the opportunity to make its way directly to our waterways, which is not a good thing. But you can do your part, be a solution to stormwater pollution, why not consider rainwater harvesting? Collect that rooftop runoff and put it to a good cause. You have chlorine-free water for your plants, might even save yourself some money on your water bill, and we'll be preventing polluted runoff. All win, 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 I think. I hope you'll join me in the chat room this evening. Go to the Making It Grow Facebook page, click on the Let's Talk icon. You should be directed to the chat room where you can log in. We already have 10 speakers and three viewers, and we hope we will add you to the conversation very soon. Soon. If you're using a mobile device, you'll want to access Facebook with your favorite web browser. And if you have the option, choose the desktop site, not the mobile site. That should save you some headaches. Amanda, back to you. Thank you so much. And we're so happy to welcome Rita Bachman. And Rita um, was a former student of Tony's, and but you've gone on to big and great things. Tell me some of the things you're involved with. Yes, ma'am, and thank you so much for having me here tonight. I run my own business called Rita's Roots Backyard Harvest, where I set up and install organic gardens in residential yards and then teach people how to grow food throughout the oh, year. Oh, all right, so you help them become gardeners. Yes, ma'am. What fun. <laughs> and um, do you have to teach them how to cook, too? Um, occasionally, yes. Mm -hmm. And then, but when I first met you, you were doing something else. And what was that? Yes, ma'am. I'm also the farm manager out at the Dirtworks Incubator Farm on Johns Island. You're the woman on the tractor. Yes, ma'am. That's mm. me. <laughs> Good. Glad to have you with us. And Tony Vertowski has helped so many people become um, horticulturists mm -hmm. and, um, and pursue it in many different ways. And what are your goals for your students? Well, uh, thanks for having us here. Um, I'm sorry, you're at Trident Technical at Trident College. At Trident Technical yeah. College, yes, I've been teaching there 16 years, and what I've seen over the years is a lot of people come there to learn about plants, obviously, uh, but what they get when, when they come to the program is not just trees and shrubs, but we do all sorts of things. We do turf, we get into irrigation, we get into lighting, construction, as well as vegetables. So a lot of our students start off just wanting to come in and learn about plants, but they find out there's, a, there's numerous things mm -hmm. to do in this field. And one thing that we were talking about earlier is um, the biggest mistake, perhaps, that homeowners make. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's kind of wasteful. Yeah, the one thing I see that goes wrong with a lot of yards is having an irrigation system, and it's just mismanaging it. And I think we tend to overuse irrigation. Um, one thing people get from coming to the program is really learning technically how to handle an irrigation system. In the summer, would you believe, we lose, at the heat of the summer, about two-tenths of an inch a day. 
So when we know that, we can figure out exactly how much we've got to put on. Well, um, we're glad you're here helping us answer Thank questions you. tonight. Thank you. And another student, Kim Ambrose, has um, branched out into her own line of work. And Kim, tell us what you're going to talk to us about tonight. Well, tonight I'm going to tell you how to plant your own window box. It's a good way to bring color into your porch. And we're going to use, since it's Memorial Day weekend, we're going to use the red, white, and blue theme um, just to give some festivity to your porch. Well, we all want a festive and colorful porch, and I can't wait to learn more about that. And now we're going to check in with Dr. John Nelson, our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina. Hey, John. How hey, you doing? Hey, Amanda. Have you had a chance to get out and enjoy some opportunities for botanizing? Oh, yeah. It's already a great season for um, studying the native flora, and uh, I've been out a number of times, and I'm looking forward to getting out this coming Friday as well. Um, so far, we haven't had too much trouble with mosquitoes, but I'm thinking this weekend after this rain that that may change. Um, have you been swatting a lot, or have it been pretty nice so far? Um, well, it's interesting. We always get a whole bunch of mosquitoes uh, in the middle of the summer and in our backyard here. And um, I have noticed that the little mosquito babies are swimming around in some of the um, in the bird bath and then the uh, rain barrel. That I've got. But um, I empty those things out pretty quick. Oh, good, cool. good, 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 mm -hmm. good, good. I was going to say, you and Teresa can have a chat about how to keep them out of your rain barrel, um, <laughs> if you had it properly constructed, that is. Um, John, you are so kind um, to offer a free service to the citizens of South Carolina, and that is plant identification. And if someone has something, somebody called me today and said, we planted this and we can't remember what it is. And I said, I'll send it to Dr. John. And if they want to bypass us and go directly to you, how do they do that? Well, it's real easy, and um, I'll just give me a call. We'll figure something out. You could bring it by the herbarium here in Columbia, or you can send me a picture of what you've got, and that usually works just fine. Um, and if it's sent to me as a, a JPEG attachment to an email, that's you know, there's no problem with that. We love to get stuff. We're getting a lot of things in, from people's gardens these days. Last week, I had a lady who had... Uh, called me up and sent me some pictures of this terrible looking thing that was in her backyard. It turns out to be a giant bamboo. She didn't know that she had bamboo. It was coming over from her neighbor's lawn. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, maybe she better put that house on the market. Well, John, we'll check back with you in just a moment. Thank you. All right. Okay. And we've got our first caller. Ova, I believe is how they said it was. Ova, is that correct in West Columbia? Um, yes, it is. Well, we're so glad you called, and how can we help you tonight? Um, I have uh, purchased some cross vine. Cross vine? And, yes. My sister has it in Texas on her fence, uh -huh. and it's just absolutely gorgeous. But after I purchased mine, um, a gardener at the flea market told me not to plant it because I have a septic tank. And she said that it would get in the septic tank, it would go under your house, and I uh -huh. was calling to see if that is true. I have a cyclone fence uh -huh. I want to put it on. Okay, all right. Um, Crossvine is a real favorite of mine, and I like to grow it um, near a fence or someplace where I can mow, because it does, even though it's a native, sometimes spread a little bit. But I don't think it'd be a problem with a septic tank, because it's not going to go have roots any deeper than that. What do y'all think? No, I, I think with uh, cross vine, if it is bignonia, because I know that cross vine, when you get into common names, it can, uh, things can get confusing. But if it's the cross vine bignonia? we're talking about, uh -huh. bignonia, uh -huh. it should be absolutely fine. That is not a deep rooter. That's a pretty safe one yeah. to use. So I think when you get into septics, you got to be worried about um, things like willow trees, things mm -hmm. that love water. Those are the things you got to be worried about. But I think you're okay because, with the Because, um, you know, so many people think that plant roots are just way down there, but if you start digging them up, where do we find most of the roots? Most of the roots can be actually found in the top six to eight inches of the soil. So and I think she'd be all right. I think the septic yeah. tank, I hope it's well below <laughs> that. We certainly hope so. We have a call from Georgia. Troy's calling us from Louisville, Georgia. What a treat. Thank you for calling us. And where are, where's Louisville? Can you hear us, Troy? Yes, ma'am. Where is Louisville? Uh, it's in uh, about... <laughs> 50 miles, 60 miles south of Augusta, Georgia. Okay. Well, that's not too far from here. We can imagine what life is like there and what's going on that we might be able to help you with tonight. 
I have a technical question. I'm trying to find out if I can spray a chemical supplementals for a pre-emerge. I'm sorry, you broke up for a minute. You have to repeat that, please, sir. I'm trying to find out if I can spray a chemical sonolan woody ornamentals for a pre-emerge for uh, several different weeds. Um, Troy, what I'm going to suggest that you do, please, is that um, since I don't have access to that information here, I think in that case, when you're talking about something that specific, it's best to check with your local county agent office. They can look the information up with you and give you the best response. Um, when you get into chemicals, especially ones that aren't ones that um, are the just general market, um, I'm not comfortable talking about that because I'm not an expert in it. And um, it really is critical that they be used in the right way. And I, ad I, I want to tell you, I applaud you for not just going out and using something. So mm -hmm. many people do. And you are making a very wise decision by seeking advice. Um, you just need to seek it from someone who's more knowledgeable than me. Okay. Um, Ginger, Ginger's calling us from Lexington. Ginger, are you a redhead or did you, did you just get the name Ginger? Well, it's Virginia, but I... Nickname is Ginger. Well, Virginia's a beautiful name, and Ginger's a cute nickname. Um, well, have you got um, red hot pokers or, or ginger root in your garden, or what can we help you with tonight? I just wanted to uh, find out about, um, oh God, cat briar. Yeah. Someone told me it may be cat briar that's growing up against my house. Uh -huh. It was real pretty last year. It had leaves, but this year. Is bald and it's got stickers. And do I get rid of it or? Well, uh, that's kind of fun because um, you want to tell them what I was doing when I when y'all came in tonight. What I was weaving together. Did you notice? Mm -mm. I saw. No, I didn't see it. The um, the base for my hat is always Smilex. Okay. Ah, mm -hmm. all right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and but, so let's. She said last year it was really pretty, but right now it's in that kind of new stage. Mm -hmm. Um, I. If she thought it was pretty last year, what do you think? I think that it'll probably be pretty again next year. You just uh -huh. have to give it a little time to grow. Yeah, yeah. Tony? I, well, I didn't catch it's what It's cat or Smilex. Oh, and she smilex. said last year gotcha. it was so pretty, she had it growing on the house. And I think it can be a beautiful vine mm -hmm. if you get one of the nice ones. Yeah, and, you know, Smilex, at least in the Charleston area, a lot of times um, we don't see it growing so much ornamentally. But it certainly is tough. So um, if there was good luck with it this year or last year, I can't imagine why not. Well, and some of the... Um, you know, the varieties that have smaller leaves are very yeah. lovely and can yeah. help cover up um, if you've got a place that needs a little covering up. Yeah, I don't think there should be a problem. Yeah, I think that was very nice that you called and asked about that. Um, Sumter is known for Swan Lake Iris Gardens, and as Memorial Day rolls around, we get ready for the most exciting part of the year here, and that is the Sumter Iris Festival, and it will be May the 23rd, the 25th, and the 26th, right at Swan Lake Iris Gardens in the heart of Sumter. We have magnificent um, birds for you to view, not only swans, but anhingas and cormorants and great blue herons and beautiful um, cypress trees growing in the water, boardwalks to make it access easy. And we'll, for this special event, we'll have vendors and um, food and um, Japanese iris um, available and all kinds of plants and crafts. It's really a glorious three-day event and I hope that you will come and join us for this wonderful event in the heart of Sumter. Um, free parking, free admission, it's a really wonderful event for our family. Come to the jewel of Sumter Swan Lake Iris Gardens. And Tommy Burgess, who's one of our most accomplished cameramen, um, went over to Swan Lake and put together a beautiful montage of some of the scenes you can expect to see if you come and visit. So let's visit Swan Lake Iris Gardens with Tommy's beautiful filming.
wonderful tradition in South Carolina, spending Memorial Day in Sumter at Swan Lake Iris Gardens. And in case you think Tommy was using magical photography, you can see right here by me, I've got some examples of the beautiful iris that I went over today and picked, and they really are wonderful. And you can't even tell I picked so many. There are hundreds and thousands of them there, so I hope we'll get to see y'all this weekend. Um, we're going to go right to the mystery plant and see what you guys know. This is the first time uh -oh. some of y'all have been up here, so we'll, uh, we'll have to tease y'all and see. We're going to Dr. John Nelson and the mystery plant. John? Well, Amanda, I think that our panel is a pretty smart bunch. This one might might be a little bit of a challenge. Right? Oh, Lord, when you think it's a challenge, John, we are in real hot water, I think. But it's a really pretty challenge, and I've got to say my friends Jim and Tim came back just the other day from a cruise in the Mediterranean. From the Mediterranean? And, uh, that's right. And, wow. Uh, Tim sent me some pictures of this tree growing in Haifa in, in uh, Israel. My goodness. And it's just a plant that will blow you away. It's a tree now, Ooh. and uh, yeah. it's pretty sensitive to cold. Uh -huh. It's a, a native to um, Central South America. So um, this is a plant that I don't really like it to get too cold. And I don't know if you could really grow it around here. It might maybe grow in Charleston or Savannah, but still with some protection. It's a gorgeous plant. The leaves look a lot like a mimosa leaf. Mm -hmm. And then the flowers look for all the world like a uh, princess tree mm -hmm. uh, flower. Mm -hmm. And it's actually... Um, <clears throat> Uh, related to the lady called earlier about crossvine, it's in the same family. It's in the Bignonia family. Mm -hmm. Only this is a tree, uh, not a vine at all. And of course, the, the flowers are gorgeous, and the big old things are butterflies. And now, I'm, John, excuse me, I'm confused because yeah. it looks like they're purple in the big picture and pink in the little picture. They. Um, you know, there's a lot of variation. Okay, <laughs> so we're looking at the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, this is okay. the same thing. All right, okay. And um, and I just, you know, I had to, to be honest, I had to do a little bit of review to uh, <laughs> figure out what this thing is. But it is really a, um, a wonderful plant. Well, let's and, have uh, some of those um, John Nelson hints, or what you consider hints. <laughs> do you have any, any little tricks right, well, for Well, for the, the common name, there's not too many, um, there's not too many hints, but... Uh, um, so I, I don't know, this, that's probably not going to work out too well, but it's, uh, um, it's got a special name, and it is in the, um, the Bignonia family. Okay. And so um, I guess I'm not making much sense here. But, um. Anybody would take a stab <laughs> at it? Just make something fun. Yeah, uh, monkey tree. I'm going to go with monkey tree. Monkey tree? Yeah. Monkey tree? Yeah, am I close? That's about the worst guess I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> See if you come well, I back. never heard of one, so that's got to be a, at least a shot. <laughs> well, that was pretty good. Look, like, you probably like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, any, you want to try to top that one? I was wondering if any parts of it were edible. Oh, can you eat any of it, John? I don't, I don't think, but okay. I think monkey trees are great. Oh, great. Well, that's good. Well, monkeys love beauty. They do. Um, well, well, that was a wonderful, so, so what are you going to call it, John? Oh, well, just, yeah. we're, we're supposed to call this thing uh, jacaranda. Oh, jacaranda. And, okay. I know it's sort of a, a manic plant name, and it is something that we we see coming out of uh, South America, and uh, it will grow in, like I said, it'll grow in, in plenty of warm places around the world, but it is um, sometimes a little bit weedy. Okay. Um, well, that was... Um you know, you could have at least worked veranda into it. It is the South. So um, <laughs> if you pull that one out again for um, down the line, you can work veranda into, into one of the broad hints. But I, we appreciate your being brave enough to go ahead. It was a shot. Okay. Okay. And Thank it, you, took John. A shot. And we will look forward to seeing you, um, seeing you next week. Thanks so much. We'll probably have to have a, a little bit easier. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> <Please. Okay. laughs> All righty. Well, one thing that is easy is to um, visit with our dear friend Teresa Lott in the chat room. And we hope mm -hmm. that she's got a lot of people in there with her. What's going on, Teresa? 
We do have a pretty good crowd, 14 speakers, 8 viewers. The number changes constantly, and it I don't think, well, there's a limit, but we've never reached it. So if you haven't joined us, feel free to jump on in, join in the discussion. Well, there was a question asked about how to get rid of clover in your turf grass, and uh, my response was, are you sure you want to get rid of the clover? It's great for bees, um, and we just talked about it in our office. It's being used in pastures as a nitrogen fixer, so it can improve soil fertility reducing uh, in input costs, um, which can also be beneficial at the homeowner level. So maybe just reframe your idea of what a lawn should be. Amanda, back to you. Good advice. You know, we, um, we tend to fuss sometimes at farmers and say, oh, they just have monocultures. And we fuss at tree farmers, you know, for growing pine trees. And yet, what do we do in our own yard? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So if you let a little bit of um, clover in there, then I think you've... Um, you should be proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. yes, thanks, Teresa. That was a good idea. Um, Rich is calling us from Boiling Springs. Rich, thanks for calling us. What's your question tonight? Well, I've got uh, three tomato plants, one of which uh, has been, we've been getting some ripe tomatoes on it. For You've about been getting now. tomatoes? Wow. Yep. And, um, but the problem is, just before I get out there to pick them, something takes bites out of them. <laughs> And I don't, we don't have squirrels around us. We don't really have established trees. But uh -huh. I, put a, I put a bird net over them anyway. And um, I don't see any holes in the ground for anything coming up from there. So, right. and, okay. and they were still getting, still getting the bites out of them. So you got any ideas? Well, um, I'm going to target my friend at the Dirtworks Farm. <laughs> Absolutely. And see what ideas you have. My first idea was indeed the bird netting. Mm -hmm. um, my second question was, do you have a dog? I had reports of dogs eating people's tomatoes right off the vine. Um, but since the bird netting is over, my next suggestion would be to use either a cayenne pepper or a garlic spray mm -hmm. and spray the ripe fruit. Um, and maybe that would be a deterrent to whatever's taking bites. I, people used to tell me that turtles sometimes would take a bite out of a tomato. You ever heard that? <laughs> I haven't heard of well, turtles. Well, you think if you picked them, you know, they say when they get to a certain stage mm -hmm. that they will ripen and have that flavor. At what point do you think you can pick them maybe before something outdoors mm -hmm. would want to eat them and bring them in and still get that good ripe flavor? What do you look for sometimes? I look for about half of the tomatoes starting to have decent color on it. Okay. And that was going to be even my next suggestion is just to pick it a little bit yeah. early. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. I am just um, so envious that already um, I know. picking tomatoes, that's wow. great. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, James is calling us from Charleston. And uh, James, do you know any of these fun people we have here with us tonight? Uh, yes. Well, My good. My father always had a saying, when all else fails, read the instructions. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so I think that might be what I've done here, but... Um, you call this stuff that stops weeds, don't you call it pre-emergent? Well, um, that's one that's supposed to keep them from germinating. Yes, that's true. Right. Well, um, I've never tried it before, but I bought some last week. Uh-huh. And uh, I had a row of peas. Uh-huh. And the pea, and I had the tomato plants, you know, I planted next to the peas, and now the peas are over with. So I took all the peas up, and in the peas, you know, there was always some grass that would grow up in them. Uh -huh. English peas, I'm uh -huh. talking about. Yes. So I thought, you know, I would try this preen. And so I bought some last week, and I went, to, I, I tilled this morning, and I put all my amendments in the soil and everything. And then I sprinkled the preen on there, and then after I did that, I started reading the instructions back here and I started wondering it didn't have anything on there about vegetables okay and so I don't know if you so I didn't know whether you were supposed to put this stuff around ve vegetables I thought you were well my dear so when I called the uh, company the man told me that this preen it says weed preventer stop weeds before they start for southern gardens he so said so that what, no, is your, what is your question, James? What's your question? The question is, is he told me that this would, uh, the tomatoes that are next to it, after I put this down, that that would, if I watered it in, not to eat the tomatoes. Okay. All righty. Well, let's see what we can come up with. First of all, a pre-emergent only works against, uh, on seeds, I think, that haven't germinated. So grass is... Looks pretty germinated to me, mm -hmm. but it's confusing, and I understand that. But um, 
if it says you not to put it on vegetables, what would you, I mean, don't you think that I would he, follow yeah. the label on that one. Yeah, and, and he cannot eat these. Yes, ma'am. So his only hope is that he will have the same problem that Rich in Boiling Springs had, and some critter will come and eat them that will not be harmed by it, because um, you, may, you cannot eat these now. And there's probably a clearance time. Would you think there's a clearance time, Tony, that would be listed before he can replant? After usually there is. That? Yeah, usually on the label it'll tell uh -huh. you something like that. But since it doesn't have vegetables on there, it'd be difficult. You know, a lot of times with pre-emergence, it, it can run its course over uh, a period of two to three months. But it might, uh, that should but be, I, do you think that should it, be included on the label? Um, oh, how long the residual is going to mm -hmm. last? Um, it might, okay. uh, but I don't know if it's going to be spelled out clear enough for well, him. Well, I hope that um, if nothing else, he can start a raised bed yes. and with fresh new soil and still plenty of time to grow mm -hmm. some tomatoes, I hope. And Amanda, there is actually an organic alternative to using non-organic pre-emergence, which is corn gluten. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. Um, it will last for about 28 days after you mix it into the top couple of inches of the soil and it prevents seeds from germinating and also adds nitrogen. Um, Betsy Humphreys is one of our very careful gardeners mm -hmm. here in Sumter and she has it delivered and now the man who brings it knows exactly where to put it at our house and she's been so happy since she's Great. been using it. Well, mm -hmm. and that corn gluten is 10% nitrogen mm -hmm. too, so you're yeah. also getting fertility with it. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yes. I'm, very, I'm so glad that you remembered to bring that up. <laughs> well, um, one thing that we, we were talking about Swan Lake um, Iris Gardens and the Iris Festival on Memorial Day weekend and we have someone here who's going to help us make our houses um, look patriotic and that is my guest on the side counter and I'm going to go over there and join her while um, we check in with Teresa in the chat room. Teresa? Thanks, Amanda. I am so fortunate to be able to see wonderful photos that are sent to us on our Facebook page. And this photo was actually taken in West Virginia, but shared for identification thanks to Dr. Nelson, our plant ID expert. This is Galearis spectabilis. And uh, in this case, the Latin name is very fitting. The Galearis stands for helmet, which is represented by those two petals at the top that kind of form a hood. And the spectabilis means remarkable or admirable and I think there you get the common name the showy orchid so even though those Latin names are tricky and hard to pronounce in this case they perfectly describe the flower let's check in with Amanda and her guest at the side counter all righty Kim Ambrose um, has several jobs in Charleston and um, one of them I think is with your family your husband yes we own a landscape company in Charleston and we do uh, maintenance and um, installations and papers. And what's the name of your company? Leadenwall Landscapes. And I asked where Leadenwall came from and I was surprised at your answer. That's the river where my husband grew up and our, our first farm was. Um, and is that South Carolina? It is. It's on Wadmala Island. Well, how lovely. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then you have um, something that I think reflects, reflects your passion because you apparently like flowers. I really do. So what do you do on the, when you're not busy draw, hunched over the drawing board? Uh, well, when I'm not designing or um, making sure everybody's yard is beautiful. I uh, make sure that their decks and their windows are beautiful. A lot of people, uh, especially downtown, don't, mm -hmm, have, a don't yard. have a yard. So this is a way for them to have a special little garden um, that they can, you know, show off okay. color. You've got a, a very attractive box here. And have you used treated lumber or is this available? Did you have this built or did you find it already? I actually bought this. Um, at Home Depot. Okay, so it's you just found Just it. a okay. standard, but it's a good one because it has good drainage and it's deep it's, enough. Yeah. It is, and it's off the ground, which is very important. You know, the holes will not do you any good if, if they're sitting, sitting on, the on the ground. Okay. Oh, I see. What you're saying is that the way it's constructed, mm -hmm. there's a space right there. Mm -hmm. And before you put the soil in, we looked and it did have some good size good holes. Good size holes. And you don't put anything to cover those holes. No, ma'am. You want to just put a... So tell me about the potting medium that you, the medium that you're using. Well, you want to use um, a potting soil and there are plenty available on the market and you don't have to get anything special, but you just want to make sure that it has a lot of perlite and vermiculite. You want to have... Um, good medium that has uh, good water retention and drainage. Okay. And um, and you got one that also had some fertilizer in it. Yes. Okay. And most of them now come with that. Okay. All right. So um, we've got um, this lovely box and you've got the soil for those of who, who are watching the soil is about two thirds um, of the way up. Two thirds of the way up. And um, let's see what we can do. All right. Well, the first thing I do is I add some soil moist. Um, also this back. But what that does is it helps retain moisture. This is very critical, especially if you do not have irrigation, mm -hmm. then this will give you, maybe you miss a day to water, this will help you. And then when it's 100 degrees, this will help 
your plants stay perfect. Boxes might need to be watered twice a day. Yes, we want them to drain. So now, you, that's now good. tell me how much you put in because this is very, amazing. Y'all just don't go very this. little. Believe it or not, this is all that you need. That is just one little spoonful. And you said you're going to put that on now. I do. Yes, it just sprinkle okay. it right on the all top. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. And, um, and we're not going to have to mix it in. That's going to happen as we put our plants in. That's right, as okay. soon as we put the plants in. Well, how do we start putting our plants in? Well, you want to have three things. And one number one thing that you want is a spiller. So we'll just grab this Creepin' Jenny. Mm -hmm. It's a great spiller, and it has a very good color Oh, it's it. a fun color. So and it's a new, color, a new dimension to green, doesn't yes, it? Yeah. Yes. So it's a really good one. And I'm going to put two in the front just to give some contrast. And that really takes the um, the bang, it extends it because instead of everything just in one plane, now we're going into a whole nother dimension by going down the front yes. of the box. And whenever it's a spiller, I like to push this against the front so that it grows that way. Yes, okay, and encourage it. Encourage it, yes. All right. So the next thing we're gonna use is a white petunia. Those are now, pretty. I picked these because they look now. All before of these you put those in, let's look at the root system on that because um, sometimes we get something. These look pretty good. Mm -hmm. But um, explain what would if you had roots that looked real tight and circling. What you would do, please? Uh, the first thing I would do is break that up. Uh -huh. And this one, this one is pretty good. I still will break it up and and press it. Up. What you want to do is stimulate the growth and the roots. So anytime that you break it, that root's going to grow. Okay. So, so that's if it looks like it's a little pot bound. Just pull the roots apart. A yes, little bit. and don't be afraid. Okay. They they oh, that won't looks that much. Pretty already. So we'll press that up against Alrighty. the front. And all these flowers were picked because they look somewhat like um, red, white, and blue and fireworks. If you look at the, oh, the shape yeah. of them, yeah. they tend to... Uh, pow, pow, pow. Yes, Explodium. and then you've got yeah. these. So the idea is... And so you've got your, your three colors in the okay. front. Okay. And we actually have, yeah, because we've got this lovely green, which is different from the foliage color on mm -hmm. the jeans. So I have a layer right here, and then I'm going to add just a little bit of dirt behind it. And again, you've got that nice, well-drained soil that's got the peat and perlite in it. And I can see those yes. little expanded particles in it. Those are the little white pieces that are in it um, that help so much with drainage. Yes, they create pore spaces, which okay. lets the water run through. And then the bark helps hold in moisture some of the moisture. Yeah. And then along with the other. Okay. So then I've got, we'll go with, it's always a fun, it's fun to do. So I bring, I buy lots of plants, uh -huh. and then I like to just put them in there and mess around and, and see what looks really good. Don't well, be afraid to play. And I think if play. you go to people's houses, too, sometimes they may say, oh, that's just so wonderful. Let's use that. Mama used to have that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And geraniums, I love, geraniums do very well in flower And they have pots. such a nice smell. They okay. do. I'm going to tidy up some yes. of these little leaves for you. And don't be afraid. Whenever they're... What a bright, wonderful, vivid red, too. It is. Okay. So that's going to be my next layer, okay. and that's what we call filler. Mm -hmm. So then we go for the little more filler here. And that is a pentas? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now this one, you can see that the root, this is from a, not from a local nursery. This, I'll show you the difference. Look at this root system. Boy, that is Now nice. that now is that a root actually, you need to pull apart a little yes. bit, Yes, and I really, I mean, don't, you can really tear them up. If you cannot get them by hand, just don't cut your finger off when you're doing that. I've done oh, yeah. that before. Okay. Because that really is critical. Otherwise, the roots will just continue in a circle and they won't spread out through this and, and have this whole area. That's to... right. And they'll girdle and you just, okay. it will never, never do very well. So, so it feels like you've just taken it out of its girdle, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> out of its, <laughs> its girdle, which go. is always a good thing. <laughs> right? And you can play around. I mean, it's, it's not a, a set idea when you go into these things uh -huh. that you can move a plant around. Oh, and it's fun too. We've got different colors of red, so we're already getting a little yes. bit subtle here. And then we'll put the larkspur in. Okay. In this what case, is though. lovely, lovely color. And again, one of the things I think that's fun is you've got a lot of different textures in the flowers. The petunias have that kind of big, full um, petal shape. Yes. You know, fused petal. And then we've um, got the geranium, which is so much fun. And then the pentas has a fine little foliage. And then look at this wonderful different shape on the, um, on the larkspur. Absolutely. And the more contrast that you can get, especially with different foliage, mm -hmm. the more attractive the flower pot is. And don't underestimate how many plants you can fit into a flower I'm, pot. I'm seeing that, yeah. I because would not want to be in your carpool. I think you have <laughs> nine children in the back seat. Oh, I, can, I will make it work. Trust 
trust to me. And so this one is another one that's root bound. So uh -huh. I'm going to break that up. And then this, my idea was that they getting a little bit of height there. Uh -huh. Right. And it gives you it's two different types of salvia. Mm -hmm. And this and pot is more so for far a from the way they uh, used to be when they were only this tall. How yes. fun to have these big tall salvias. All kinds and all of, of these varieties. are going to bloom all summer. Yes, ma'am. They will. Okay. It will probably around September. You'll need to now, spruce it up. Okay. And then we had talked about um, you. This soil mixture already had some fertilizer in it, but again, you said by the time the summer's gone by, things will need rejuvenating. They will. And at that point you might take some of the faded flowers out, the ones that look like they were kind of gotten too big for the box. Yes. Petunias are, petunias are bad for that. They yeah. tend to get a little overgrown. They do. Yeah. And you can just, especially with them being right in the front, uh -huh. just oh, pop so them, out. them out. And then pop something, pop something else, else in, especially something that might catch your eye at the local garden center. And then you think, oh, that'll be Oh, a right. good little, and then, and then in September you said probably you would add a little more fertilizer. And what kind do you like to put on at that point? Um, I like a slow release uh -huh. uh, granular, right. something with a, a higher nitrogen content. And then I can't one believe more. she's still putting things in here. I, I would have been finished five minutes ago. Oh no! <laughs> All righty. So there you go. And now you have a fourth of, or a fourth of July Memorial Day. All right. Well, ta-da! <laughs> Easy. What, what fun. It really is beautiful. And um, slowly water. Be sure everything's well um, saturated. Yes. And then um, be sure to keep up with it because when you've got this many plants, there's a lot of transpiration going on. Yes, there is. And um, tell me, I think that um, your window boxes have been recognized um, by some kind of fancy people. Yes, they have. Um the Charleston Horticulture yeah, you come over here so we can see okay. you because now we've got you. Yeah. We want you to get your, your kudos. The Charleston Horticultural Society you for, stop tidying and two, talking about for two years has had a window box competition uh -huh. and I have been the winner for the last two years oh. and it's a it's a big honor. So. Well I think we are, we are honored to have you with us and so pleased that you came and shared your skills and ability with us. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. All righty. Um, that was great fun and now we're going to go back to Teresa because I know she's always having great fun in the chat room. Teresa? That is right. Always great fun. You know, we just heard about thrillers in terms of plants in a container. We also sometimes think of a thrill in terms of watching wildlife in our backyards. And that's what Marcia has shared with us with this photo of a northern cardinal nest. And what I think is really interesting about cardinals, it's the female that does the nest building. The male will contribute some parts, but the female does the majority of the uh, heavy lifting, so to speak. She will crush the twigs in her bill and make them pliable, and then she'll sit in the nest and turn her body around on those twigs in order to shape them into that cup shape. So I would expect there to be an addition to this egg. We might end up with uh, two to five eggs, and they should hatch somewhere between 11 and 13 days. So I expect, Marcia, that you'll share some photos as this progresses. Amanda, back to you. Thank you, Teresa. And Tom is calling us from Irmo. Hey, Tom, how are you, and what can we do for you tonight? Amanda, I'm doing just great. I have a question for you about magnolia. Magnolia, magnolia brand of Florida to be particular, but before asking my question, I have to give a shout out to all my friends and associates with the Mid State Beekeepers Association and also the South Carolina Beekeepers Association. Well, we got a bunch of people there. We, um, we, we, applaud, we applaud all of you who are taking care and reminding us of how important those pollinators are to um, the beauty of our yards and to the wonderful foods that we eat all the time. Thank you. So what's your question about your magnolia? Well, I have two magnolias, sort of a tail of magnolias. About 10 years ago, I bought two magnolia saplings about four feet tall from a local nursery. They were basically identical in shape and size and everything else. Uh -huh. I planted them in the heavy, rocky clay that we have here in Irmo about... They're about 30 feet apart. Okay. And they have been growing over the years. They're both about the same height now. They're both about probably about 30 feet or high or so, and maybe 15, 20 feet across in breadth. Okay. Here's my conundrum. One of these trees has half as many leaves as the Ooh. other. Ooh. Why could that be? And this has been a condition that has been persisting for many years. I first noticed this kind of difference probably a few years after they had planted them. They're the same height, same okay. width. Okay, okay. And you've been, and, um, and, the, and the soil is the same as far as you know? It's, it's almost identical soil, okay. identical topographic elevation, identical sun exposure, practically just everything that's 
if you think of it would affect a tree is okay. almost the same. And were they um, were they um, labeled cultivars when you bought them? I'm sorry, ask me that question again. Were they labeled cultivars when you bought them, or were they just um, seedlings? Was it a fa Would it had a? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but they were from a reputable nursery, and they were about four feet tall at the time, and so you know, well established. And I think they were in large containers, okay. like about a right. fifteen or twenty gallon. Pot. All right. Well, yeah. let's see what we can do for you. Um, anybody have any ideas? No. I, the thing with uh, when you get really symptoms that are hard to diagnose, something like that. There's so many things that can go wrong. Um, that could be internal, that could be just things that nobody would really know. Uh, so when you were talking about things that uh, have fewer leaves, a lot of times that is indicative of something environmental, but as he's saying, everything appears to be as far as, mm -hmm. as far as we know, and that's uh -huh. a good way to as put it. So nothing obvious jumps out about something like that. But you had a good question about are, are they exactly the same cultivar? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes if it's near a house with construction, you don't know what got buried 30 mm -hmm. feet apart. Well, do you think it might be worth just trying to take a soil test? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, two soil tests, one for each tree. Absolutely. And maybe because you're right, sometimes, you know, we had a situation once where um, some hollies were doing so badly, and it turned out they had washed out the, um, the cement truck. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. and so you don't know what might happen. And I'm so glad you brought that up. That was really a good point. Mm -hmm. um, I wish we could give you a more of an idea than that, but that's a good place to start. And the reason we asked about cultivars is sometimes if things are seedlings, um, even though they're seeds off the same tree, it's um, my sister, you know, and I, um, I weigh a, a certain amount, and she weighs almost <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and, um, and my children, one is real tall and one's real short, and, you know, and we're all from the same tree. Mm -hmm. And so when you get a cultivar, if you want things to match in the landscape, sometimes it's worth um, paying a little extra and getting, would you think maybe, tell them about if you think that it would work. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because when you're getting a cultivar, you're getting, you're getting the, the, the genotype that is specified there. So, yeah, um, if you're getting something, like you're saying, with the seeds, you don't know what kind of genetic differences could be in there. It sounds like he bought them at a reputable nursery and they but should, sometimes should be the same. Do have but, seedlings, mm -hmm. so. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing that does seed down and have a lot of genetic difference and we're delighted that it does is native azaleas because new ones um, sometimes crop up and people find them. And the gentleman we went to visit, Mike Creel, actually has discovered um, new, a, new cult, a new variety. And, um, but his yard is a fairyland when these are prolifically in bloom. I'm visiting Mike Creel near Lexington, South Carolina. Mike is an expert on all things native in the plant community, and we came today to learn about native azaleas. Mike, what distinguishes native azaleas from the ones that we more typically see? Well, native azaleas are uh, naturally occurring in the wild uh, in different locales, and all native azaleas are deciduous, they're not evergreen. So that's one good thing, because every winter they drop all the leaves and drop all the pest. Um, but they, occurred, they occur in the wild, they're places where nobody planted them. Um, you can get them from, uh, from, from nurseries from time to time, or propagate them yourself and grow them in your yard, and they do wonderful in yards, but you have to realize that no evergreen leaves, but also fewer pests and uh, greater hardiness uh, more, more, more variety of color, good smells. Mike, one of the things that's, more, that's fun about these is since the leaves are just coming out when a few, some of them start to bloom, um, you really get to see that flower. And tell me how the flower clusters are arranged. You said there are lots and lots that come from, that you'll find together. Well, um, Neozaeas have a single bud, and that bud can have anywhere from eight up to even 50 flowers in a single bud. So when it unfolds, you see it opening, and some country people call that, uh, when it starts to open, it looks like a turkey foot. They call that a turkey foot azalea, but it will open up, and in each of those little uh, small buds will have multiple buds in them. So say if you've got uh, 10 flowers in a bud, and, and, and somehow you've gotten, gotten three buds together, you've got 30 flowers in what they call a ball truss. 
We also talked about the fragrance that so many of them have. It's one of the sweetest, but it's a light, delicate fragrance. And you said that some of them were even called, um, people got it mixed up with something else that flowers in the spring that, that, that's real fragrant. Well, some people think uh, that they're smelling um, yellow jasmine. But if you look around right now, there's no yellow jasmine. And, and the things that are fragrant mostly right now are, are the um, neighbor's azaleas, and also uh, probably half more of your dogwoods are fragrant. Um, but you have to wait for the, the bloom to open up, and the bloom is a little center yellow part. Um, but uh, the, we've got eight species of neighbor's azalea that occur wildly in South Carolina, great range of color, uh, and I'd say about half of them are fragrant. One of the things that is interesting is that we think of when you have azalea festivals in places, they're looking at the imported azaleas, but do you have a long bloom time with our native azaleas? If you grow all the species that are native locally uh, in, in the states of like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, you can have bloom all the way from earliest spring over, over into as late as September. They like, uh, most of them like high shade, by high, I mean way up in the air shade, not not amount of shade. And also they like acid soil, most of them do. There's uh, at least one that, that likes circumutral soil. Um, but th that acid soil and, and the high shade just really, really favor them. And a big thing I've got growing them is to, is to, is to go out on, on dry days and, and prospect for planting sites. And what I try to do is I try to plant plants where they'll live and survive as opposed to where I think I might like them. You know, plant plants where uh, they where they want to be, not where you want them to be. So high shade is one thing that's good. How about drainage? And do you want to have, um, do they like to be planted somewhat high like camellias and other plants that do well in acid soil? Um, if, if you're in sandy area, we're, we're in the fall line sand hills right here. You can plant them, plant them just flat. In fact, I, uh, in fact, there's so much sand here, I've even taken old stump holes and, and a stump hole is probably one of the best places anywhere to plant something. And I just, I'll take a shovel and I'll redig all the rotted um, bark from a tree into the stump hole and plant the plant in the stump hole. I've never had a plant, a uh, azalea die planted in a stump hole, never. And that even works in clay area, but if you got more clay, you do need to uplift them some. But we're sandy right here. Mike, I think that um, other people are interested in heritage plants, and these, of course, do have a wonderful heritage. They're native and not even just ones that were imported and used for a long time. If people would like to learn more about these plants, where's the best place to do that? I would go on the Internet and go to the websites of the uh, American Road Industry Society and the Azalea Society of America and, and look at all their information. Also, um, become a member, and both of them have great, great publications. Well, we thank you so much for sharing this beautiful landscape that you've created with us today. Thank you. A true naturalist and lover of native plants who shared his knowledge with many people, and we appreciate that Mike Creel let us come and enjoy the beauty he's created in his Lexington garden. And uh, when you wear the, ride the tractor, do you wear a hat? I do. I usually wear a big sun hat to keep that would sun this, off my would face. This, would this help at all? That might wilt in the sunshine, but it looks absolutely <laughs> lovely on you. <laughs> um, again, um, just reminding you all about this, the Iris Festival here in Sumter, um, which is this weekend, um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, Newberry, oh, one of our favorite places, you know, making it grow. Went up there and had a live show in that opera house. Oh, it was so beautiful. beautiful. And um, this, on Sunday, May the 31st, Saturday, May the 31st, from 10 to 5, Newberry has several beautiful gardens open, including, interestingly enough, the Japanese garden, which I visited when we were there. Um, and um, each one will feature an exhibit by a local artist. So you have gardens and art. What a wonderful combination. I hope that you will visit the Newberry Chamber of Commerce and find out about making a trip to Newberry. What a lovely, friendly town. Um, lots of great food, beautiful houses, and very friendly people. That's Saturday, May the 31st. Okay, and Rosabelle is calling us from Lexington. Hey, Rosabelle, how can we help you tonight? Well... We have a weed in our yard that looks like a lily pad, and we aren't sure what it is. A weed in your yard that looks like a lily pad? 
in the grass. Okay, and is it is it and do you um have kind of a wet turf or what is your turf like? Um well kind of in the middle. Okay. Well, Mr. Turf Specialist, tell me what's <laughs> going on. Well, let me ask a question. Is the lily pad about the size of a quarter? I think she's gone, but I have a feeling that's what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. And that's um, what we call dollar weed. Most people are familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, and we could spend a half an hour talking about this. But most people have that. You asked the question, uh -huh. was it in a wet area? That's usually indicative. Um, it's a perennial, it spreads. If you really want to get rid of it, you need to use a post-emergent herbicide to kill it. Here's an interesting fact. In northern regions where it won't overwinter, they actually sell it as an ornamental for ponds. How about that? No, we don't want it down Yeah, no, here. we don't want to do that. No. Okay. Um, so I, I think that Clemson HGIC has fact sheets on that. Absolutely. And I imagine that you refer to those sometimes, too. That's a good source mm -hmm. to find definitive um, things for South Carolina. Thank you. you okay. All right. Goodness gracious. Um, Rita, I mean, Kim, I want to thank you so much for being with us. And I think you've got a little partner there. Tell us who she is. This is Grace, my youngest daughter. She helps me a lot with my flowers. So. And tell us if people want to find out about you, how they can. Well, we can go, you can go to my Facebook page, which is Ledenois Landscapes, or our website, which is LedenoisLandscapes.com. All righty. And we thank you for being with us today. Teresa, we thank you so much, as always, for joining us. It is always my pleasure to be here. Had a great time in the chat room, and I look forward to answering questions and seeing photos on the Facebook page. Amanda? All righty. And Tony, um, you sure picked some nice students. When I was down there, I think a lot of your students are nice. You've yeah, got well, a, you'll have luck. a good program, and um, we congratulate you on turning out so many fine horticulturists. Well, thank you. You really do, and thank you for being with us tonight. Mm -hmm. And Rita Bachman, um, tell me, you've got a website for people who might want to learn how to grow vegetables organically in their backyard. Yes, ma'am, I sure do. It's ritasroots.com. 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 <laughs> and you actually go and um, you help them set up the garden yes, and bring the amendments and the plants. So it's really... Um, it's I just do. A turkey it's like job. A, a garden delivery service. Okay. Garden then, in a truck. And then um, you have a cell phone that you carry at night, so they can call you when they're when they're worried about for things. garden emergencies. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we hope you have no gardening emergencies um, because we're going to be off next week. But we will be back the next week, and we sure hope that you will join us for another hour of making it grow. Night night. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.